Our today virtual panel is part of the sixth edition of Med Dialogues, the global hub for high-level interaction uh, on the broader Mediterranean, organized by ISPI, together with the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the International Cooperation, usually on, on live, on um, flesh and blood, but not, not now, as you can, can imagine. 26 years after, uh, 26 years after uh, the Wadi Arava agreement with Jordan, a peace treaty between Israel and other Arab countries in a region uh, plagued by, by, by conflict and instability is a big event per se. But if we look carefully into the wording and the, the meaning of the Arab agreement, a lot of compelling, compelling issues arise. No doubt the treaty is a watershed in the Gulf-Israeli relation. Uh, out of the open atlas, uh, trade, technology, finance, and possibly military relations will flourish. But how real is the potential of a new balance of power in the region? What is the strategic relevance of the Abraham Accords? And if it has, how Israel, for instance, will balance its uh, aspiration to annex part of the West Bank or to avoid an independent Palestinian state with the need to contain Iran? An answer to this question would define uh, the real relevance today of the Palestinian cause in the Gulf and the rest of the Arab countries. In other words, this accord is going to redraw the map of the Middle East alliances or further deepen many of the existing four lines and increasing the regional instability. I can, I can find a third way. Last but not least, what this current diplomatic development tell us about the future of the American influence and stance in the region? We will try to find some answer with our concerned guest, uh, Cinzia Bianco, which is a visiting fellow of the European Council of Foreign, of Foreign Relations in Berlin and senior analyst at the, at the Gulf State Analytics. Uh, Nimrod Gorend, uh, head of the Mitvim Institute, uh, the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign P Policies, uh, Khaled uh, El Gindi, Senior Fellow of Director of, Director of Program of the Palestinian, on Palestinian uh, and Palestinian-Israeli Affairs at the Middle East Institute in uh, DC, and Harold David Miller, uh, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie in DC also, and uh, a veteran of Oslo and its uh, uh, aftermath. Uh, we will I will give you five minutes each answering my question. Uh, for the, then we are going to have a second round of question and answer. And the last 15 minutes will be dedicated to the Q&A with the audience. Uh, I will exploit my, my uh, I will exploit, sorry, the global crisis of democracy using my uh, satrapic power vested to me by my position as a moderator. So I will, I will try to be uh, harsh and uh, give no more than five minutes to you. I would start with I would start with uh, Cinzia. Uh, Cinzia, um, what is the most important element uh, uh, in, in the Abraham Accords for the for the Gulf? How will the Abraham the Accords uh, affect diplomatic relation between Israel and the Arab countries? And do you think that uh, Saudi Arabia to some extent will follow uh, Emirates and Bahrain. Good afternoon to my fellow panelists and everyone tuning in. Um, very pertinent questions, Dr. Tramballi. I will try to do my best in addressing them all in five minutes. I think that um, the first uh, step, the first sort of thing that we should uh, agree on is what to call these agreements because um, effectively, although for convenience we call them peace, peace agreements, they are, uh, they are not because they, there weren't any wars between Israel and the UAE or Israel and Bahrain. They are more precisely an agreement to normalize the relations between those countries, to establish diplomatic relations in the open between those countries. And I emphasize in the open because there was a lot of informal, and there were many informal contacts uh, uh, over the decades, in particular between Bahrain and Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Israel. And those intensified 
um, I would say after 2015, when it appeared clear that Israel and the UAE and Saudi Arabia had very similar threat perceptions vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and those threat perceptions were heightened, uh, unfortunately, uh, by uh, a um, ill, uh, a, a, a difficult uh, reception of the nuclear deal with Iran, uh, alias the JCPOA. So this already puts us, I think, in the right context to highlight what, which ones are the most important defining features from the point of view of the UAE and Bahrain on these normalization deals. And I would argue those are a formalization of an informal alignment in how those different parties view the future of regional politics. Um, on one hand, I say that. On the other, I do caution that um, the perception of Iran has changed after COVID-19 and after, as a, as a consequence of the maximum pressure campaign, at least in the UAE. Um, whereas, you know, up until 2019, Iran was the absolute priority threat from Abu Dhabi's point of view. Um, in the past few months, uh, that threat has become less relevant, I would say, than, for instance, the one posed by the so-called Islamist axis, those made by basically by Turkey and financed by Qatar. And that this is how the Emiratis would uh, define what is their priority threat. But again, Israel is very relevant in this context. And if we look at the very complex alignments in the Eastern Mediterranean, it is increasingly um, apparent how having uh, Israel on board or getting closer to Israel potentially down the line can be extremely useful if a new regional alignment and front has to be cemented against Turkey. So. Uh, this is, of course, particularly uh, relevant from an Emirati perspective, but I would say that, uh, and here I talk briefly about Bahrain, that this is also relevant for uh, the Bahrain-Saudi uh, duo. Um, the, for Bahrain, it wasn't um, as controversial to normalize relations with Israel, given that, again, uh, Bahrain had served as a platform for meetings uh, uh, with Israeli officials uh, before. Um, what I think we're going to see now is increasing uh, these sort of um, exchanges using, again, Bahrain as a platform, but also to um, further contact with Saudi Arabia and with Saudi officials. Um, there is a fierce debate going on in Saudi Arabia about whether to normalize or not normalize relations with Israel. Um, a lot has to do with uh, a desire in Riyadh to strengthen even further their position in Washington, especially uh, now that a number of strains may appear, given that, for instance, if Joe Biden is elected president in the US, uh, Saudi leaders, for, for instance, Mohammed bin Salman, will have to uh, confront a very different disposition in Washington to what they have been used to. And so this element of normalizing relations with Israel helps further one's position in Washington DC is absolutely crucial for uh, all of the Gulf, uh, Gulf countries that we are talking about and in general, all of the Gulf countries. Uh, however, and here I come to your, final, to your final question about what are the ramifications in the wider Arab world. Um, once again, we see that uh, the issue of normalizing relations with Israel is, has been very polarizing, even within the Gulf. We have players like Kuwait and Qatar who absolutely don't think that it, should, it would be useful for them uh, or wise to normalize relations with Israel. Um, we have a player like Oman that has, in, within, within its own decision-making circles, of course, a, a desire to pursue very uh, quiet, unconfrontational relations with all different regional players, but this includes Iran, and therefore there are uh, key concerns in Muscat, whether to the normalization of relations with Israel would uh, uh, create strains in their relations uh, with uh, Iran, which they would like to make it, uh, to maintain it as a working relations. And this polarization that we see in the Gulf is largely reflected in the wider region. Therefore, we can expect 
powers and, and players that are closer to the UAE and Saudi to consider uh, normalizing relations uh, with uh, Israel, but players that are instead closer to Kuwait and in particular Qatar and Turkey to be especially uh, reluctant about it. Thank you. Thank you, Cinzia. It's a sort of, uh, of um, Libyan uh, pictures also for this uh, agreement. Uh, Nimrod, uh, um, uh, Nimrod, Nimrod Goren, uh, how important is uh, for Israel uh, the regional and geopolitical implications of, uh, of this accord? Yeah, so good being here with you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's definitely a major uh, regional step uh, in Israel's foreign policy approach. You know, many tend to see these agreements as kind of a symbolic move, as something that was given to Trump as a pre-election gift, or perhaps just going open with a relationship that has been happening already in the past. Uh, but in practice, what you see emerging is a different sort of relationship with another country than what Israel used to have in the past. Now, there's a lot of potential in it, but there's also a pitfall of utilizing that either to increase regional tensions or to brush aside the Palestinian issue. I think so that's where uh, you, we have to take this potential and try to leverage into progress also to advance uh, peace in the region. Uh, as was said before, this is an outcome of a gradual process. Uh, Israel has been talking about relation with the Arab world for the last five or six years. Actually, Netanyahu tried to reverse the order of the Arab Peace Initiative, which was calling for a settlement with the Palestinians and Syria, by the way, first and only later, moving for normal relation with the Arab world. And Netanyahu consecutively tried to claim that the other option is also possible, that you can flip the sequence, that you can move forward first with the Arab world and maybe with the Palestinian later, uh, and is using what happened now with Bahrain, with the UAE, as kind of a um, winning argument for his claim. So we have to see whether other Arab countries are willing to play along, whether it's a shift that is limited only to those countries, um, and how you can challenge uh, that assumption. Uh, now, sorry, Asian, sorry if I interrupt you, um, but could it, mm, could this uh, agreement be intended as a personal success of Bibi? I mean, uh, maybe just to, maybe you're going, I, I, I missed the, 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 the count, but you should have possibly the fifth elections in less than, uh, than two years. So. Well, so first Netanyahu has been uh, personalizing Israel's foreign policy for the, first, for the past years. You know, he's been serving as a acting foreign minister in 2015 to 2019. He's been uh, positioning himself within the public eye as an ultra uh, statesman, as the one who achieves almost everything, who works with global leaders, who has a significant place on the global uh, stage. This was his campaign, so this fits exactly his messaging. You can see his conduct around it, how he's going alone to the ceremony in Washington without taking any ministers on board. Um, his um, order to the ministers not to travel to the UAE before he himself goes there. So there's a lot of personalization of that, but in practice, this, uh, this relationship have been evolving over time uh, by different governmental apparatuses within Israel. So definitely the security establishment was involved, but the Israeli foreign ministry on ties with the UAE and the Gulf has been there for two decades. And we have to remember that Netanyahu was not the first Israeli leader to establish these relations. We go back to the 90s, we go back to what happened between Israel and the Gulf after the Oslo Accords were signed. That's when a government a ministerial visit took place, economic summits happened, diplomatic representations were opened up. So there was something happening there before Netanyahu came to power, uh, and Israelis often tend to forget that. Uh, we can also see that on the public level, these agreements do not give a political boost for Netanyahu domestically. Uh, the political power expected or anticipated for his party, the court, is actually declining these days because the way he is managing uh, the coronavirus crisis. Uh, but in a way, uh, these developments spark a new discourse within the Israeli population. We once again hear talks about peace, about hope, about regional cooperation. It lessens security fears. So the right type of leadership that unfortunately is not the one we have now could have mobilized these public opinion trends into more willingness for concessions for progress on the Israeli-Palestinian track as well. Thank you, thank you, Nimrod. Uh, Khaled, uh, usually when you, in the past, at least maybe last centuries, at the beginning, at the beginning of this century, we used to have uh, um, the Palestinians as a center, st cent center stage uh, of any 
peace process or any peace agreement. Now they're, they're out of the, of the map. So how did the Palestinian Authority and the population react to, to this agreement? And uh, are there any prospect of the leadership of unification among the Palestinians? Um, elections? And at the end of the day, did they, the, 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 maybe the Palestinian leadership made some mistake in this, uh, in this last decade, 15, 20 years? Khaled. Khaled, it's for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, first of all, let me say that I, I agree with everything that's been said so far in terms of how we frame and how we understand this, uh, this uh, these accords. Um, I agree very much with uh, Chinzia that these are not peace treaties. Uh, I think it's a there's an awful lot of um, spin and wishful thinking that is going on in relation to uh, to what these agreements are. I think uh, Chinzi also did a, an excellent job of explaining how transactional these agreements are as opposed to transformational. And I think that's important for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, we heard a lot about Bahrain and, and about the UAE. I would also uh, mention Sudan uh, in this context, which even though it is not a Gulf state, it is, um, I think, uh, uh, and it's very different, from uh, either uh, the UAE or Bahrain, I think it is equally transactional, but in a very different sense, uh, because you have a weak country uh, in a weak uh, state uh, that is in a very delicate moment in its transition. Uh, and of course, there was enormous pressure and coercion brought to bear by the Trump administration uh, and others to bring uh, Sudan uh, into this process. Um, so it, it, I think in, in a lot of respects, it's kind of the opposite of diplomacy. Um, as far as what do, these, what do these transactions mean for the Palestinians and for a two-state solution, um, I think part of the answer has come from the Palestinians themselves. Uh, they are uh, very much opposed uh, to this. There's almost unanimous consensus uh, on, on opposition to this uh, normalization trend in the Arab world. Uh, whether we're talking about Hamas or Fatah or even Palestinian civil society. Um, and there's, I, I think it's also pretty clear that uh, Palestinians are losing a very important, uh, uh, one of the very few sources of leverage that they have had vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, uh, given the already uh, fairly significant um, power asymmetry between them. Um, and of course, I think it's it's also true that these uh, these normalization deals further marginalize the, the Palestinian question. Um, so the Palestinian leadership, I think, has responded in, in two ways. Uh, first, internally, uh, it's forced Palestinians to close ranks. Uh, we saw a new round of reconciliation talks in Istanbul that produced a, an agreement and at least a call for uh, not only reforming Palestinian institutions, but also for holding elections. Um, in many ways, we've seen this movie before, um, so that part of it isn't new, but, but I do think uh, that um, it is kind of a break or make, uh, make or break moment for the Palestinian uh, national movement. Um, and these normalization threats, I think, pose, uh, or at least I should say that there is a recognition by Palestinians across the board that these uh, agreements pose something of an existential threat. Um, uh, the other way it's responded is regionally. Um, they have moved closer to uh, Turkey uh, and uh, to uh, Qatar and have sort of not necessarily turned their back on their traditional um, allies in the Arab world like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, but those relations uh, relationships are, are clearly uh, uh, strained uh, at the moment, and they have been for some time. In terms of impact on a two-state solution, um, I think it's, it's pretty clear to me, at least, that the normalization trends represent um, another blow to an already very beleaguered prospect for, uh, for two states. Uh, I think there's, uh, as I said, there's a lot of spin and wishful thinking that goes on on the part of the diplomatic and analyst community, um, particularly here in Washington, um, where there is a, a tendency to conflate things that are good for Israel, 
um, uh, with things that are good for the peace process. Um, and it's very hard, I think, for a lot of people in Washington to, um, uh, to, to criticize something that is so clearly in Israel's benefit, but which has, I think, um, pretty serious, I think, negative ramifications for, for a two-state solution. Uh, uh, the reality is that, you know, as I said, this removes uh, leverage from the Palestinians, um, but it also removes, I think, incentive uh, for Israel to end its occupation and allow uh, a, pal a Palestinian sovereignty. Uh, and frankly, it, it, uh, these kinds of things further embolden uh, what is a very right-wing government dedicated more or less to a greater Israel agenda. Um, I, I, so I think, I think it's a mistake to imagine that normalization can somehow uh, be used to spur uh, movement towards a peace process. Um, and I think it's, it, it, it's evident in the way the Saudis and others have responded. Um, we saw, for example, this three-part interview with Prince Bandar in Saudi Arabia, um, which was a kind of a public diplomacy offensive on the Palestinians. Uh, and of course, it's broadcast not only to Saudis, but all over the region. Um, uh, as a way of sort of softening the ground, perhaps, for a future uh, normalization. Um, but it's, I think, indicative of this, uh, of, of the kind of zero-sum thinking that exists uh, in the Gulf states. In, if normalization had been even remotely beneficial to Palestinians, I, I think they wouldn't need to package it um, uh, as kind of throwing Palestinians under the bus. Um, but I think it's also negatively impacting uh, the realities on the ground. We've seen a huge spike in things like uh, settlement uh, announcements and approvals, home demolitions, whole communities that are faced with uh, expulsion uh, in the West Bank and in, in Jerusalem. Um, uh, we've seen also a real kind of clumsy lack of regard for things like the status quo arrangement uh, on the on the uh, Haram al-Sharif and, and Temple Mount. Um, and, and most recently, we saw this report in the New York Times of how the UAE and the U.S. are establishing this fund uh, to um, uh, ostensibly to streamline uh, things like checkpoints, something like three billion dollars. Uh, but in reality uh, is uh, really going to end up kind of further entrenching the occupation. Um, and at the same time, uh, we're seeing Arab states uh, literally divest from the Palestinian Authority, which I think amounts also to a divestment from, uh, from a two-state solution. Um, uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, Arab states have basically cut their uh, funding um, and brought that policy in line, at least with the Trump administration. So the bottom line, I would say, is that uh, normalization, I think, is, uh, is a sign that Arabs, Arab states are divesting from a two-state solution in much the same way that the, the U.S. and Israel have already abandoned the goal of two states. Europe is still rhetorically committed, of course, uh, but unwilling to take any real meaningful action um, uh, or impose any costs for uh, Israel maintaining the status quo. And I think Arab states are sort of left asking themselves, why should we be the only ones uh, to sit around waiting for this unicorn called a two-state solution? We're going to pursue our own interests uh, regardless of how it affects uh, the Palestinians or the prospect of two states. Okay. Thank you, Khaled. Um, Howard Miller, um, should I stay or should I go? Uh, what do the, the Arab, the Abraham Accord uh, tell us about the, the American uh, strategy in the region? First, Ugo, thanks for having me and it's an honor to be here with uh, Chinsi Khaled and Nimrod. Um, <clears throat> in 2017, 2018, I had several meetings with Mr. Kushner at his request and he made it unmistakably clear to me that they, they, the Trump administration, uh, wanted to invest heavily in the Arab states as key strategic partners, primarily the Saudis and the Emiratis. And that he, while he didn't use the expression that I'm going to use, it was quite clear where the priorities of the Trump administration uh, lay from the beginning. Uh, 
it was clear to me that they were much more interested in what I would putatively call a 22 state solution rather than a two state solution. And they went about investing strategically uh, in this enterprise. Personally, both the president and Kushner invested in personal relationships, Jared Kushner particularly with Mohammed bin Zayed and Mohammed bin Salman. And they created a degree, a margin of running room for the Saudis and the Emiratis that both of these authoritarian and repressive regimes were only too happy to respond to positively, particularly in the wake of the Obama administration. And it's, it was indicative of the administration's approach that an American president, it's historic without precedent, certainly, um, decided to take his first foreign trip, not to Britain, Canada, Mexico, NATO, but to Saudi Arabia, and then, of course, Israel, in a symbolic effort, I think, more than symbolic, to essentially reverse what both the Gulf states and the Israelis believed was a fundamental uh, challenge from the Obama administration. And since the Trump administration's foreign policy is governed by its subordination to the president's political interests on one hand and his desire to be the un-Obama on the other, um, this was a welcome and natural, somewhat natural change for the Israelis in the Arab states. And I think should the administration get a second term, we can talk about that in a minute, they will continue to invest to some degree at, as heavily, I'm not sure, most of the political gains uh, and the political pressures for a second term president will be gone. There'll be no need to please and cater to the evangelicals and probably not even conservative Republicans uh, who will find themselves once again empowered by an American president who's very popular with a sufficient number of Americans to get reelected. Should Biden win, right now that looks, look, look, looks a tad more likely. Uh, should Biden win without a serious process of contestation in which weeks from November 3rd, we still do not know who the president of the United States is, but should Biden win uh, cleanly and decisively, I would think that uh, he too, preoccupied with domestic political realities, will, will also want to invest in an ongoing process. I mean, and Khalid, Khalid I think, summed it up. Who in Washington could, could object to a process of normalization between Israel and key Arab states, which has fundamentally reshaped the paradigm, or appears to, the way this administration approaches Middle East peacemaking. So I, I, I think that um, regardless of who wins, they're going to be left with a very changed environment. An Arab world that is in varying degrees of dysfunction, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, to, to some degree Iraq, uh, an opening for the Gulf states, particularly the Saudis and the Emiratis to, to some degree occupy that space. And finally, uh, a continuation of a trend that's been in train now for some time. And that is the emergence of the three most functional and powerful states in the Middle East, the three non-Arabs, Israel, Turkey, and Iran, all politically stable, all with tremendous economic potential, one a member of NATO, however fraught that situation is becoming, one America's closest ally in the Middle East, and a third, um, a third um, at the moment at least, at fundamental odds with, um, with the United States. Three non-Arabs, I, I think, hold tremendous capacity to shape this region in, in ways that are 
both positive um, and negative. One final point on the Abraham Accords, and I agree with, I think, all of my fellow panelists. This is a transaction. It's a transaction driven by a narrow coincidence of interest between the Emiratis, the Israelis, and the Trump administration. Whether or not it becomes transformative and has a significant and strategic impact on the region is going to be is going to depend not on the headlines of these signings, but on on the trend lines uh, going forward. Who else signs up? What is going to happen to the issue of a two-state solution and the problem of Palestine? And what about changes in leadership within Israel? Because Mr. Netanyahu is facing the evidentiary portion of his trial, which begins early next year. And there are some who argue that he would like to put together a narrow right-wing government in order to fundamentally escape the judicial noose. Um, but in this environment with COVID and economic recession, he would be foolish to do so. So there are an enormous number of variables. Why should any of us be surprised uh, about this? Um, and um, uh, it's going to be a fascinating three months here in Washington, and I suspect a very uh, interesting next year uh, in the region. Sure. Thank you very much. Let me come back to Cinzia. Um, uh, we, you, you already explained to us what the, the reception, what is there, has been and is going to be the receptions uh, of the agreement uh, among the, the rest of the, of the Gulf countries. But let's suppose, what, I mean, what, what if Netanyahu will decide to annex part of the West Bank or to open some uh, new settlement there? Uh, would this accord survive? I mean, we, we already saw a few last week that the Israeli government decided to enlarge uh, some settlement to, to build up new houses. But I, sorry, maybe I was, uh, I was not very, 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 very careful, but I, I, I missed some reaction from, uh, from the Gulf. Yeah, Cynthia. that's a, that's a very good point. Um, so, let, let me uh, first of all say that only the UAE has claimed that this agreement is in any way is related to the Israeli-Palestinian process. And their argument is this agreement actually postpones uh, maybe indefinitely, and that's their point, uh, the annexation of the West Bank. Uh, so only the Emiratis have gone as far as to state that there is some connection between uh, the, 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 the agreement and the Palestinian question. However, they've been also very blunt in saying that, however, this, is, uh, this agreement has to do with our interest as a sovereign power and our national interest. And I mean, I, I second Khaled's point um, that the Europeans ha are uh, committed to the Israeli-Palestinian process, but mostly rhetorically, and they have never followed up with some concrete actions. Uh, and, and that's definitely the case. However, um, you can definitely see how the Europeans remain interested, at least politically, and very invested in the process, uh, by the fact that these entire deals are being uh, explored mainly from the angle of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And of course, this makes a lot of sense. However, this misses, I think, the bigger picture. And that's why I wanted to highlight in, in the first uh, round of, uh, of presentations that this is about much more than uh, what happens to the Israeli-Palestinian process. And it is, I mean, it was long known, although never openly said, that the question uh, was becoming less and less relevant from the Gulf point, from the perspective of many Gulf leaders. And this is the ultimate proof. However, I think we should not be distracted by uh, 
the fact that, again, there is an intrinsic strategic value from an Emirati point of view that supersedes the, the Israeli-Palestinian question. And I'm sure then to go back to your point that having said Having said this context, um, the, if, if annexation happens, the Emiratis would definitely protest, would definitely put up uh, a diplomatic uh, um, confrontation or, or you know, uh, have uh, strong statements, but they would not walk back from this agreement because it is about much more. Uh, than, than the Palestinian question. It is about uh, redesigning potentially the whole geopolitical boundaries of the region vis-a-vis uh, -vis the two main threats as they view them. One is, uh, the, the most important one is Turkey backed by Qatar financially, which coincidentally, incidentally, is, are also the two powers that are closest to the current Palestinian leaderships. And therefore, this provides another rhetorical ammunition from the Emirati point of view, who, like some some other countries and for instance in Saudi uh, some parts of the Saudi leadership have are being strongly um, contesting the Palestinian leaderships and, and saying that in fact they have been missing many opportunities for peace so uh, I think you you know it's uh, it's really helpful if we also try to, to zoom out and see how all of a bunch of side deals, for instance, in the, uh, the, the access to the port of Haifa uh, by DP World, or possibly the establishment of uh, new cyber infrastructures connecting the two countries, including, for instance, underwater cables connecting you know, Europe uh, to Asia, bypassing uh, a bunch of other con conflictual places in the Middle East, or uh, possibly building a pipeline that would allow the UAE to completely bypass the Strait of Hormuz and export directly its energy to Europe. All of these things, I think, um, have to remain in, in our mind as we do confront, I mean, the really uh, serious question of uh, what this means for the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace process. Thank you. Nimrod, um... Um, the same question, but from the Israeli side, uh, basically. Um, uh, are the Arab, uh, the, the Abraham uh, Accords, the end of uh, any sort of greater Israel uh, or the annexation uh, is still uh, on, the, on the agenda of, uh, of the present Israeli government? At least a simple majority as, um, of Israeli don't want to see the uh, Palestinian state uh, and, uh, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. So, but if I well understand uh, what Cinzia said, that the, the, the Emirates they, they didn't make any red line that, uh, that o over over which should the 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 the, the accord could could be at least frozen. So. But what is the point of view from the majority of the Israelis that are, is, are again are against the, the, the Palestinian state? And if uh, if they are forced uh, to to because to, to maintain the, 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 the agreement with with the Emirates with the Gulf, they will renounce of uh, of this. What would happen for also for Bibi? So first, I will differentiate between the issue of establishing a Palestinian state and the issue of uh, annexation. Uh, because I don't think it's the same thing. You know, Netanyahu definitely one of his strategic goals when you look at his decade of power is to prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. And he has been doing it first in practice and then in declaratory means as well. You know, Netanyahu has been maintaining and fostering the divide between the West Bank and Gaza. And we heard before about negotiations between Fatah and Hamas uh, that once again will probably not go very far. So Netanyahu wants this divide to be maintained because that lessens the feasibility of a two-state solution Netanyahu tries to take the two-state solution off the international agenda, okay? So it's not by chance that we've heard about European inaction over the last few years. It's not only about Israeli policies that drive that, also it's internal European divisions, but definitely if you look at the major international actors that have been active along the years to push forward a two-state solution, you see that they are not in the game and they are not motivated to be part of the game. So the field is in a way empty. Now, the issue of annexation came up as an election issue. Okay, Netanyahu, the previous government, was the one blocking partial annexation of Mali Edumim. Now, he, he picked it up and utilized that and uh, emphasized it and made it a very big thing. But as months went by, I think what he saw is first the Israeli public in general was not mobilized 
to support it and consecutive public opinion polls in Israel showed there is no big enthusiasm for annexation. And if we ask it, even now, and we did it at between, uh, whether the public is happy or not that annexation is off the table, you have a vast majority, including the Kut voters, that did not even want annexation. It doesn't mean that they want a Palestinian state. I think from Netanyahu's point of view, you can consolidate uh, Israeli control over areas in the West Bank without formally annexing, without being threatened by international action, whether real or not. You know, we heard a lot of threats from the international community about consequences of annexation. They weren't uh, specified, so you know, European leaders warning Israel of annexation did not say what will actually happen if annexation takes place, but this left an impact. So you can do from an Israeli right-wing point of view, you can continue your policies without the fanfare of annexation. And I think that's what Netanyahu would like to see happening. And I think that if this is happening, you will not see a lot of pushback coming from the Gulf. Uh, because the UAE, at least in, in my conversation with people there, they, they very much emphasize their role in stopping annexation. They portray themselves as saviors of the two-state solution, as the one who removed the largest obstacle. Uh, but I don't think that any statements like the settlement statement that we heard last week will raise any reaction or opposition or challenge to the agreement itself. Uh, what could raise some challenges is when there is an ambassador, an Emirati, a Bahraini ambassador on the ground, when there is escalation in Gaza, when there is a turn to violence, when there is a reaction by other Arab countries with diplomatic representation in Tel Aviv, then there may be some sort of uh, give and take there. Uh, but I don't think that Netanyahu will renew his uh, quest for annexation. I do think that we need to look at how to make use of the UAE having ties with Israel uh, to make some progress on the Palestinian track, even if it's not now. Assume a different American administration takes place, takes office with a different policy for the Israeli-Palestinian issue, even if it's not a big foreign policy priority, uh, I think the UAE discourse may change. Another key point in time will be whenever there's a change of leadership in the Palestinian Authority. I think that may be the time when the UAE will try to put its foot in the door and make a big impact on Palestinian politics because they do have an aspiration to impact that. So that will be something to, to look at. And finally, going back a bit to the regional dynamics where, where we began the first round and where Cynthia uh, uh, related to, I think it's worth uh, to look also at the Eastern Mediterranean, which was mentioned, because basically the UAE is now becoming a player in the East Med. Uh, you may see, for example, a Emirati request to join the East Med Gas Forum as an observer state. Okay, what does that mean? That's a platform that has Israel, Palestinian Authority, Jordan, Egypt, European countries. Okay, what does that mean in terms of Israel's relation with Qatar? Okay, so Israel and the UAE do share eye to eye on Iran, and that was mentioned, but they have differing views on other regional aspects. Israel cherishes its relation with Qatar now, the UAE does not like that. Even the perspective on Turkey, I think Israel tries very, uh, clearly to be in some sort of a balancing act between its alliance with Cyprus and Greece and now the UAE and its desire to maintain at least a formal diplomatic ties with Turkey that could bring some benefits. So Israel will be a bit cautious to take the bilateral Israel-UAE agreement into the broader regional dimension, but rather will try to advance bilateral projects, some of which were mentioned. And I think that's the place where we see, you know, as Israelis, immense progress happening over the last uh, one or two months, which is really surprising. The amount of cooperation, engagement, dialogue, projects, official and unofficial, between Israel and the Emirates goes way beyond the initial expectation. This is only a trans like, transactional thing. Uh, it goes very deeply and very quickly with a very warm language. And for Israelis, this is new. How to make benefit of that? I think first we have to keep the Palestinian issue uh, on the front of it and try to push for Palestinian uh, participation, representation, involvement in projects involving Israelis and Emiratis. That may not come from Washington, uh, it may come from Europe. Thank you. Uh, Khaled, uh, in this, um, into this framework, how the, the two-state solution could be re revitalized? And uh, could the Biden presidency do that, do something? I mean, that's the million dollar question. Um, I, 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 think, uh, I, I think it's entirely possible that it may be too late to try and resuscitate prospects for a two-state solution. Um, this isn't the only negative trend line. I think every single trend line you look at, the regional dynamics, the facts on the ground, uh, 
um, the politics in Israel, the politics in the United States, the fragmentation uh, and, and the disarray of Palestinian politics, all of these things are working against the two-state solution. And so if you want to reverse that trend, you have to actually reverse all of them uh, simultaneously. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, obviously in the United States, we're, ha we're in the midst of an election. Um, and if we have a, a Biden presidency, uh, we're likely to see um, a sort of rhetorical return to the status quo ante, um, uh, doubling down on, uh, on a two-state solution as the, as the desired goal and a reversal of many of these policies uh, like uh, expelling the, 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 the PLO mission um, and cutting off uh, aid to the Palestinians. Those are likely to be reversed. Um, but I agree with Aaron. I, I think the next administration, uh, regardless of who wins, is going to be tied up with other issues. Um, but particularly a democratic administration, I think will have a, a very, very full plate in terms of putting the American House back in order, all of the, 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 the issues that Aaron raised. Um, and foreign policy in general will become a, a, a back burner issue. Um, and this issue in particular will be even further down on the list of priorities um, than, than other foreign policy issues. So um, that, in a, in a way, is not going to resuscitate uh, the two-state solution except in aspirational terms, but it could give the Palestinians some space to uh, begin to put their own house in order, because if if Trump is reelected, I think we're likely to see a, a much more aggressive move toward formal annexation. Um, and, and I would, uh, uh, there will be very, very few uh, consequences, I think, diplomatically uh, for Israel to pursue that course. It will have cover from the most powerful country in the world, uh, the United States. Uh, and Europe will probably object and, um, you know, uh, issue very harsh statements, but but not really uh, do much beyond that. Uh, and, uh, and, and the Palestinians, um, uh, you know, will be facing, I think, a more urgent situation on the ground where uh, realities on the ground, with or without formal annexation, are going to accelerate. So we're going to see more home demolitions. We're going to see more settlement construction. We're going to see new settlements being built. We're going to see a very triumphalist uh, greater Israel settler movement. Um, uh, and Netanyahu, of course, uh, has been very good at, at, uh, at playing that card domestically in, uh, in his own, to deflect from his own uh, uh, other problems. So um, if Trump is reelected, then I think we're going to see a very rapid disintegration on the ground. Um, and, and perhaps even something like the collapse of the Palestinian Authority. If Biden is elected, I think it gives at least the, the Palestinians some space to, to try to put their house in order, um, whether it's through elections or rebuilding some sort of national consensus, um, reforming and uh, resuscitating their own institutions because all of them are now stagnant, um, dealing uh, with the issue of succession, uh, in, a, in a clear way, uh, because it's unclear right now what happens uh, when Abu Mazen departs the scene, um, who or what will fill that, that vacuum. So um, I think the most optimistic scenario is one in which uh, Biden, uh, a Biden administration at least gives the Palestinians space to, uh, to put their house in order. Sure. Uh, uh, Biden or Trump, uh, China in the Middle East is not anymore energy only, trade of energy only, something more, increasingly more. Do you think that China in Middle East, in the Gulf, uh, could be, uh, could push the United States, the American administration, any kind of American administration to come back uh, uh, strongly in the, in the region? I don't. Um, I think that um, the Middle East for the Biden administration or for any administration is growing increasingly less important 
partly that's driven by this, the stunning failures in Iraq and Afghanistan. Partly it's the fact that the United States is weaning itself off of Arab hydrocarbons at some expense, considerable expense to our environment. Uh, but nonetheless, our, de our dependence, not Europe's, China's dependence on Middle East oil is diminishing. Uh, and finally, you have, as I pointed out earlier, the greatest challenge of domestic recovery that any American president has faced probably since the 40s, since Franklin Roosevelt. Without the kind of strength at home and abroad that Roosevelt's successors were left with. So I think for all these reasons, and I agree with Khalid, uh, the bandwidth for Biden's foreign policy will be uh, narrow. Um, but I, I believe in a counterintuitive way, in many respects, more active, Khalid referred to a rhetorical frame. I, and I think that's right. But I think the administration will also do, uh, try to undo what Mr. Trump has done. He'll reopen the PLO mission in Washington. He's going to start a high-level dialogue with Abu Mazen. Um, he'll do something symbolic on the ground. The embassy will stay where it is. Um, Biden, I'm sure, voted for the 1995 Jerusalem Act more than once, but also may have acquiesced in the waivers that various administrations, Republican and Democrat, used to avoid having to be forced to implement the law, which mandated that the embassy be, be in Jerusalem. Um, I think Biden is going to be more strenuous rhetorically in pushing back in the event Mr. Netanyahu decides to test him with respect to settlement activity and housing demolitions. Now, will there be a consequence uh, to Israel? beyond rhetoric? I would say no. And this, I think, is a very important point. Joe Biden is not Barack Obama when it comes to Israel. Joe Biden is Bill Clinton when it comes to Israel. A man who, and I worked for Clinton, um, I saw his reaction to Rabin when Rabin was alive and when he died. And when Clinton says that he loved Rabin as he had loved no man, it is that sort of affection uh, and long-term support for Israel that separates Joe Biden from Obama. And while the Trump campaign wants to paint him as a clone of Obama on Israel, pushing for a comprehensive settlement freeze, demonstrating real annoyance with Netanyahu, I don't think that Biden by temperament or by priority, frankly, is going to have a lot of time or space uh, to unilaterally pick a fight with the Israelis. If Netanyahu should push the envelope, it may well be that Biden, to a certain extent, will push back. But we will not involve ourselves in the region, uh, despite the growing role on the part of China. We still have many assets and, and a considerable amount of influence. That will not be the driving force that gets the U.S. to re-engage. Sorry, but, go on. But, and what about the, the, the Palestinian authority, the Palestinian leadership? I mean, in the 80s, Barack Obama was the most pro-Palestinian president in the history since uh, maybe Johnson. Uh, but the, in eight years, they, never, they, were, they were never able to exploit the, the, this opportunity. So, uh, no, they couldn't, they couldn't exploit it because it's Khalid and Nimrod will know the gaps between this Israeli government and this Palestinian authority on the core issues that would have to be addressed in order to have a serious negotiation, let alone an agreement, forget an agreement, forget a conflict ending agreement, which we wrongly tried to address in July of 2000. At the, it's been 20 years since the Camp David summit. The gaps are too large. The suspicions and mistrust are too great. The leaders are too weak, and frankly, in the case of Mr. Netanyahu, let's be very clear, we're giving him a test he'll never pass. He does not see himself, nor will he ever fashion himself to be the midwife, father, mother, deliverer 
of the kinds of things Palestinians would need in order to sign up to an agreement. That's not going to happen. And Israel is moving to the right. It's hard to see who among Mr. Netanyahu's circle, whether it's now Tali Bennett or Ghazi Eisenkrot, would be able to bring the Israeli public along. Sure. Well, you have seen uh, that I was not able to, using my satrapic power, to to force you onto the, the into the limits of five minutes because uh, you you were saying such an interesting stuff. I didn't want to interrupt you too much, and this is the reason why I do apologize with the, with the public, with the people, uh, the, the audience uh, of this uh, of this meeting, uh, not giving them the opportunity to to make to make questions because you, you, I believe you will agree with me that it was, would, would have been very, very unuseful to interrupt our panelists. So I, I do thank you very much, uh, everybody. And uh, I hope really is to see you again in uh, flesh and blood soon uh, for the health of anybody and for the health of the Middle East. Thank you very much indeed, uh, everybody. And, uh, Goodbye, ma salam, shalom, shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.